Ladies and gentlemen, before we get on to Samuel Adams Returns reading what I want to do in chapter 37 on George Duffield to my grandkids, which is coming up, I, I have to emphasize this for you about where are the pastors? Where are the pastors? Well, in relationship to that, I don't know if I'm going to get it all in in the next three minutes, but I want to read to you from uh, quotes from Duffield, the sketch, the character sketch, and then some quotes from the preface and chapter one of the book by J.T. Headley. So I want to start with this, with my emphasis here. And this is critical as to where are the pastors like this and overall in all of the historians. So in the Duffield quote, Headley writes, faith is never allowed a place in the philosophy of history. When events are being traced to their causes or probable results, though from creation till now, it, being faith, has proved stronger than the all physical force, but that it had something to do with the success of our revolution, none but a disbeliever in the Christian religion can doubt. So the only ones that doubt about the effects of Christianity in all that happened in the re revolution are non-believers. Quickly, and I don't have a lot of time here, but you need to understand is in the, in the preface, he says, I have thought the proper to devote a few pages at the outset of the influence of the pulpits as an institution in England, in New England, especially with inaugurated the rebellion, and on which fell so heavily the burden of carrying it forward, the pulpit was a recognized power in the state, and its aid formally and earnestly invoked. Now, continuing on in here in chapter 1, really critical. Notwithstanding the numberless books that have been written on the American Revolution, there is one feature of it which has been sadly overlooked. I mean the religious element. In this respect, there is not a single history of that great struggle which is not so radically defective as to render the charge against it of incompleteness a valid one. The omission on the part of historians seems the more remarkable from the fact that common belief, the universal impression, is against it. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we get into chapter 37 on George Duffield, you have to understand historians that do not bring in the fact that Christianity formed the American Revolution and the pulpits were so important, they're not real historians and were void of that truth that needs to be heard from the pulpits today, this very time. Enjoy. Hey there, kids. Always glad to be able to share with the you grandkids these truths, this history. And uh, as you well know, we're taking and sharing from a book by none other than Mr. J.T. Headley from, what, 1864. And this is all of that on the chaplains and clergy of the revolution, the American Revolution. What were the pulpits like then? And uh, quite frankly, we have very, very, very few pastors in my day where the pulpits are anything like those that spoke the truth and spoke liberty uh, to bring us to this great nation. So with that, let me not uh, continue on, and maybe we'll have some other time later. But let's get on to chapter 37 is none other than George Duffield. He's descended from the Huguenots, studies for the min ministry, is settled in Carlisle. His parishioners go armed to church. His patriotism settles in Philadelphia. King's magistrate attempts to stop his preaching is brought up before the mayor on charges of a riot, excitement of the people, his popularity with the members of Congress, stirring address, becomes chaplain in the army, 
preaches to the soldiers from the forks of a tree. Bury's a brother chaplain who has been murdered. Narrow escape, example of his faith, and then his death. Wow, what an exciting life. I'm, I don't know about you kids, but I sure am excited about this. So let's go on. Here we go. The descendants of the French Huguenots that were living in America at the time of the Revolution were almost without exception staunch patriots. Among these, none took a firmer and nobler stand than George Duffield of Pennsylvania. His ancestors fled from France to England to escape religious persecution, and thence to Ireland, from which country his immediate parents emigrated to America and settled in Pequay, Pennsylvania. He was born October 7, 1732, and received his education at Princeton College. Graduating in 1752, he studied theology in his native town under Dr. Robert Smith and was licensed to preach in 1756. He married the daughter of General Armstrong and, in 1761, was ordained and settled over the congregation at Carlisle. At this time, the Indians were numerous in the vicinity of the church and often assumed such a hostile attitude that the male members attended the Sabbath services fully armed. Sometimes it was necessary to go in pursuit of them to chase them for acts of violence, and Mr. Duffield always accompanied the expedition, sharing with his parishioners their privations and dangers. At Monaghan, one of the associated churches over which he presided, they were compelled from the exposed positions of their place of worship to surround it with fortifications, and men were stationed on the ramparts during service to give notice of the approach of the savages. In such a stern school was this ardent apostle of liberty reared. The readiness with which he shared the perils of the frontier with the inhabitants and the dauntless courage he exhibited on all occasions of danger made him known far and wide and bound him to the hardy yeomanry of the country in the warmest attachment. In the dispute that arose between the colonies and mother country, he took sides at once and fearlessly with the former. And when in open conflict and a long and wasting war were seen to be inevitable, he preached rebellion as a duty and declared that he had no doubt that God would carry them triumphantly through the struggle. Before his patriotic addresses and stirring eloquence, despondency gave way to hope, and the spirit of determined resistance was kindled in the hearts that before thought only of submission. At this time, he was sent in company with Reverend Charles Beatty on a missionary tour to the scattered settlements along the frontiers of Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Returning from his arduous journey, he received a call to the Third Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia. The Colonial Congress was then in session in the city, and consequently the greatest excitement prevailed among the inhabitants. He immediately took a bold stand on the side of Congress and denounced sternly and fearlessly the encroachments of the mother country. The people flocked to hear him, and he soon became an object of dread and hate to the Tories, who sought in every way to injure him. On one occasion, the congregation of the First Presbyterian Church invited him to preach in their large place of worship on Sunday evening when the officers of the church, hearing of it, closed the doors so that neither minister nor people could enter. The latter, however, determined not to be baffled, and prying open a window, lifted Mr. Duffield through it. They then unbolted the doors, and the eager crowd poured in and filled the edifice. The news soon spread that Mr. Duffield, 
was addressing the people on the Sabbath evening. The king's magistrate, being applied to, hastened thither, and forcing his way through the crowd, interrupted the speaker and began to read the riot act. A military officer among the congregation, by the name of Knox, rose and sternly ordered the magistrate to stop. The latter replied that he would not, and again commenced reading. A second time, the excited officer, in a voice of thunder, bade him hold his tongue, but the magistrate paid no attention to the order and went on with his reading. The officer was a powerful man, and, seeing his orders so contemptuously disobeyed, cleared his way through the multitude, and seizing the astonished magistrate, bore him bodily along the crowded aisle, and thrusting him out the doors, bade him be gone. Astounded at this summary ejection, the discomfited minion of the king took himself off, and Mr. Duffield went on with his sermon. The next day, however, he was brought before the mayor's court and required to plead to the charge of aiding and abetting a riot, and gave bail for his and to give bail for his appearance for trial. He politely but firmly refused to do either, asserting his right as a minister of Christ and denying that there was any riot whatever except such as the king's magistrate himself had created. The mayor, a kind-hearted man, said if he took such a course, the court would be compelled to send him to prison, and urged him to get bail, saying he would take as such any of his numerous friends then in court. Mr. Duffield promptly but courteously declined. The mayor then offered to be bail himself, he thanked him for his kindness and assured him he felt grateful for his ex exhibition of his goodwill, but declared that he considered it his sacred duty to assert the rights of a minister of Christ and a worshiping assembly that had been ruthlessly invaded by a king's magistrate. The mayor was in a quandary, for he knew that if he remanded him to prison, there would be another kind of a riot one which all the king's magistrates in the colony could not put down. He finally said he would postpone his decision for a few days, and in the meantime, Mr. Duffield might return home. The news that the king's government was going to put Mr. Duffield and the patriot, this patriot clergyman in prison spread like wildfire, creating the most intense excitement. It flew on the wings of the wind over the country, and reaching the region where he had formerly lived, the volunteer forces there called the Paxton Boys, though a hundred miles distant, met and passed a re resolution that if the king's government dared to imprison Mr. Duffield, they would march arms in hand to Philadelphia and liberate him at the point of the bayonet. The worthy mayor, however, seeing the serious course things were taking, never called him into court to receive judgment, and the affair was hushed up. The patriots of the First Congress flocked to his church, and John Adams and his compries were often his hearers, for he preached as Jonas Clark had before preached at Lexington. In a discourse delivered before several companies of the Pennsylvania militia and members of Congress, four months before the Declaration of Independence, he took bold and decided ground in favor of that step, and plead his cause with sublime eloquence, which afterwards made him so obnoxious to the British that they offered a reward of 50 pounds for his capture. He declared that heaven designed this Western world as the asylum for liberty, and that to rise its banner here, their forefathers had sundered their dearest ties of home, friends, and native land, and braved the tempests of the ocean and the terrors of the wilderness, not through the fostering a care of Britain. He said, had they grown and flourished, but their, quote, 
Tyranny and oppression, both civil and ecclesiastical, end quote, had driven noble souls hither, quote, to enjoy in peace the fair possessions of freedom, end quote. Tis this, he exclaimed, has reared our cities and turned the wilderness so far and wide into a fruitful field. And can it be supposed that the Lord has so far forgotten to be gracious and shut up his tender mercies in his wrath and so favored the arms of oppression as to deliver up the asylum to slavery and bondage? Can it be supposed that that God who made man free and engraved an indefensible characteristic the love of liberty in his mind should forbid freedom already exiled from Asia and Africa and under sentence of banishment from Europe, that he should forbid her to erect her banners here and constrain her to abandon the earth? All soon shall be subverted creation and forbid the sun to shine. He preserved to the Jews, their cities of refuge. And whilst the sun and moon endure, America shall remain a city of refuge for the whole earth until she herself shall play the tyrant, forget her destiny, disgrace her freedom, and provoke her God. When that day shall, if ever come, then, and not till then, shall she also fall, slain with them that go down to the pit. In such strains of impassioned eloquence did he sustain his high argument for liberty and pour his own brave, glowing soul into his excited listeners till they were ready when he ceased to shout, To arms! To arms! So great was his zeal in the cause of the colonies, and so wide was his influence known to be that his services in the army were sought for at the earliest moment, and four days after the Declaration of Independence, he received his commission as chaplain in the Pennsylvania militia. Although he had great influence with members of Congress, he was needed especially among the troops. This, too, was the place for him, for his heart was with those struggling on the battlefield more than with the, those debating in Congress. Whenever any perilous undertaking was attempted, he could not remain behind. Accustomed to the habits and peculiarities, as well as the privation of a camp life, he wielded great influence over the soldiers. He could infuse courage in the hour of danger and cheer the disheartened in distress by example, precept, and prayer. Bold and confident, he inspired confidence in others. He was well known in camp, and his visits were always welcome, for the soldiers loved the eloquent, earnest, fearless patriot. When the enemy occupied Staten Island, and the American forces were across the river on New Jersey shore, he repaired to camp to spend the Sabbath. Assembling a portion of the troops in an orchard, he climbed into the forks of a tree and commenced religious exercises. He gave out a hymn, and as the soldiers, like the troops of Cromwell at the Battle of Dunbar, uplifted to the tune of Bangor, or some still high score, and rolled it strong and great against the sky. The British on the island heard the sound of the singing and immediately directed some cannon to play on the orchard from whence it proceeded. Soon the heavy shot came crashing through the branches or went singing overhead, arresting for a moment the voices that were lifted in worship. Mr. Duffield, to avoid the danger and escape such rude interruption, proposed they should adjourn behind an adjacent hillock. They did so, and continued in their worship while the iron storm hurtled harmlessly overhead. The deep thunder of the heavy cannon 
shaking the ground on which they stood, and hissing shots filling the air with their mysterious sounds, were not calculated to lessen the eloquent patriot's fervor, or quench the glowing zeal that inspired him. It was a strange, solemn scene, yet, with all picturesque, which that group of soldiers presented, listening with upturned faces to the man of God as he urged them to fight manfully the battles of the Lord, while the deep voice of cannon uttered between each sentence their angry notes of defiance. When the army, reduced to a handful, fled through New Jersey, and night starless and rayless, and to the human seemingly endless lay on the land, his great sympathizing heart would not let him stay at home, and he kept with it, sharing its hardships and exposures, and striving in every way to encourage the hearts of the soldiers. In this disastrous retreat, he had a forewarning of his own fate should he, by the chances of war, fall into the hands of the British. In a skirmish near Trenton, John Roseburg, a brother chaplain, lost his horse and was taken prisoner. Seeing his prayer for life refused, he knelt down and committed his soul in prayer to his maker. And while in this attitude was thrust through with the bayonet and left weltering in his blood. Mr. Duffield found the body hurriedly buried by the neglected wayside and had it removed to a neighboring graveyard and decently interred. A similar fate would be his own should he be taken, for the British knew that every such re rebel parson was more dangerous to the cause of the king than a whole regiment of militia. A short time after, he had a narrow escape from it. Washington, continuing his retreat, abandoned Princeton and Trenton, destroying the bridges over the stream near the latter place to delay enemy pursuit. Mr. Duffield, worn out with fatigue and not being apprised of this movement, had retired to a private house nearby to snatch a moment's repose. In the meantime, the brigades were being rapidly, the bridges were being rapidly destroyed. A Quaker, who knew him, for he had once befriended him when in danger from his principles, seeing what was going on, endeavored to seek him out and warn him of his danger. He had by some means ascertained that he was not with the army already on the further side of the river, and hence knew he must be somewhere in the place. Alarmed at the imminent danger to his benefactor, for he was aware that the British had set a price on his head. He hastened hither and thither, and at last found him quietly taking his repose, wholly unconscious of the departure of the army, informing him, in a hurried manner, of the position of things. He told him that in a few minutes his escape would be hopelessly cut off. Warmly thanking the Quaker for the timely information he had taken such trouble to give him, he hastened to the door, mounting his horse, dashed away on a gallop for the nearest bridge, and overtook the rear just as they had crossed and were making preparations to destroy it. Many incidents and details of this part of his life are lost forever, while others are but indistinctly and partially remembered, serving only to make us regret that a complete account of his career as one of the chaplains and patriotic clergy of the Revolution cannot be given. His zeal for his country, however, never abated, and his patriotic efforts never ceased till peace and liberty blessed the land. He was a man of great humor and exuberant spirit, yet, with all deeply religious in his feelings and possessing an unwavering trust in the promises of God, whether it was his suffering country or his suffering family that weighed on his heart he turned with an undoubting faith to his heavenly Father, feeling that he would send help in his own good time. He did not escape the privations which all more or less suffered, and often his family 
were left without any apparent means of substance. On one occasion, his son came to him on Saturday night and said they were nearly out of provisions, and unless some could be purchased early Monday morning, they would be entirely destitute. But he had not a cent in his pocket and knew not where to apply for aid, for all around him were as destitute as himself. Instead, however, of allowing his mind to be distressed at the prospect before him, and diverted from the duties of the Sabbath, he dismissed the subject, saying, My son, the Lord will provide. During the day, a sealed letter was put in his hands, which, in accordance with a rule he invariably practiced, did not open till Monday morning. On opening it to the next day, he found it to contain a sum of money sufficient to relieve all the present necessities. He never knew who sent it. The same grand, unwavering faith that God would finally make us victorious in our efforts to be free never forsook him through all the vestitudes of the long and eventful struggle of the revolution. Faith is never allowed a place in the philosophy of history. When the events are being traced to their causes or probable results, though from creation till now it has proved stronger than all physical force. But that it had something to do with the success of our revolution, none but a disbeliever in the Christian religion can doubt. With the return of peace, Mr. Duffield was again quietly settled over his congregation in Philadelphia, where he remained till his death, February 1790, in the 58th year of his age. Wow, kids. Wow, is all I can say. I, and and the, the only comment that I, I can follow up with is that of Jonas Clark. And Jonas Clark was a great friend, great, great friend of Samuel Adams. And that's where Samuel Adams was the night that the British came and was looking for him in Lexington. Kids and anyone else that's listening, this is what is needing in our pulpits now with all that is happening. And it is what is needing in our pulpits forever to understand liberty and to ensure liberty is there for all of our posterity. We'll come back next time with chapter 38 and David Sanford. Talk to you later, kids.